My boy's name is John. That's right, his name is John. Not Zachariah, David, Mark, or Luke. His name is John, and so you understand. Look here, I raise my hand. I promise I will never doubt the Lord again. Dear Rabbi, is there a prayer to shut him up? His name is John! So I saw that and thought, well, yeah, until you ask your wife. And then you got to really decide what the name's going to be. Uh, we've been going through the catechism for uh, a few months now, and we would like to take a break in the month of December and just look at some Christmas stories in, in a new way with a, with a little bit of new light. And so I, uh, I wrote in my blog about um, watching the movie It's a Wonderful Life, and I'll watch it, and uh, I'll you know, be in the middle of the movie, and I'll go to take a break for a cup of coffee, and they'll say, oh, do you want to pause the movie? And I'll say, no, I already know how it goes. And so what we'd like to do this Christmas, since we already know the story, is see if we can get into some stories we don't already know. And one of the stories is the naming of John the Baptist. Uh, do you remember the old song, uh, Hello, Mother, Hello, Father? Here I am, a cat credata. Life is very entertaining, and they say it will be fun when it stops raining. By the way, isn't the snow great? You just love it this morning. You get up and see it. It's like perfect. Gosh, and if, if you're in Winnipeg, it'll be gone come the 4th of July. Anyway, he goes on in that song. He says, uh, Joe has poison ivy. Leonard has food poisoning. The lake has alligators. They sent a search party for Jeffrey, and worst of all, I've been here all day. Don't you hate it when life is going wrong and you can't seem to change it? And you, can't, you wait and you pray and you wait and you pray, and it seems like forever and things don't change. And maybe to God, because he's outside of time, it doesn't seem like that long of a time. But if you're the kid in camp, a day can seem like an eternity. And maybe for what you are going through today, it can just seem like eternity. You're waiting and you're praying. And you wonder, when is God going to answer? I, firstly, I just hate waiting. I hate waiting for anything. I've uh, got a truck out here, and uh, a while ago it was just ultra, ultra filthy. I was cutting back and forth between our house and the church on the dirt roads, and they decided to grade them, and they water them before they grade them. Anyway, it just got gross. And every time I'd get in and out, I, I'd try to step over that little running board thing, and my jeans would get all covered with filth. I thought, okay, i got to clean it. i got to clean it good, because it's been like a month since I've cleaned it. And we hadn't lived in this area before, and so I Googled, because I only had like half an hour. I wanted to go someplace close, and it was windy and blustery and nasty outside. I didn't want to do it myself, so I, I just want to find a good place. So I found a place over on 550 on my computer, and so I got in the truck, and I got over, and I took a ride on 550, and of course, there's the construction and everything. And I thought I saw it on the left side of the road. So I go over, and I get in the left turn lane, and I go over, and I drive out. I knew it was garage doors for something else. It wasn't a car wash. Great. So I go down to the end, and I turn around, I come back, and as I'm driving back down this way, right, I come back, and I see the car wash down and to the left. And it's a coin one, but that's, you know, that's okay. And so uh, I thought, oh, great, I'll just go across the road and go left. So I get up to the road, no left turn. No straight. I mean, they've added like 500 lights, right? And they've got all this construction center stuff that's supposed to be good. And when I'm dictator, it's back to gravel. So I have to turn right. So I turn right so I get in the left-hand lane so I can do a Yui. But what does the sign say at the next place? No Yui. So I go past that. Then next, then I'm stuck in the two left turn lanes going down, back down 528, back to the church. So I said, forget it, I'm not waiting, I'm not going over there. I know where there's a car wash over kind of by Target and American Tire, and I don't know, they got four or five coin bins. I'm just going to go there, I'm done. I could have gone to a little gas station, but I really wanted a good wash, you know what I mean, not a quickie wash. So I drive all the way down there, like close to Target, and I pull in, and there's this line coming out, because half of their bays are broken. And I'm thinking, one, two, three, four cars, four minutes a car, 10, 20, 30, 40, I'm a little slower than Ronaldo. I don't want to be sitting out here for 40 minutes. Forget it. It's not worth the wait. So I throw it in reverse. I get out. There's a little gas station right here on the corner. Forget it. I'll get a lousy wash. At least it'll be better than nothing. So I, I zip around. I don't need gas. So I just run inside. There's a line. I thought, well, why is there a line? There's only just a few cars here. 
So I go and I hear the guy at the front. He says, well, I don't know when the manager will be back, but the manager's working to get the system up. I know I can't check you out until the system's up. <laughs> Some would call it a first world problem, but I'm telling you it was a major problem. So <laughs> I thought, I am not waiting till the manager fixes the system. So I get back in the truck. Lynn's got a place that she likes called Intersections all the way down by Intel, right? Just this side of Las Cruces. And so I get back in the truck and I go south down to intersections and I pull in past First Baptist by Sonic there. Pull around Sonic and I'm looking I thought, oh, well, that's weird. There's no line. Well, maybe there is a God and he finally likes me today. And I pull up and there's a ribbon across down for repairs. <laughs> I hate to wait. Don't like waiting in traffic, we wait for haircuts, we wait for a car wash, we wait in Walmart, we wait for Christmas. Sometimes it's like, okay, we're gonna do something really big, we're gonna have a big family vacation, so we're gonna save for like five years, and then we go to Disneyland and we wait. I don't know, what are you doing in Disneyland? We're waiting in line. Zachariah waited his whole life. You know, in scripture, we really only know of one prayer request he had, and that was for a son. And uh, if it's like most marriages and families I'm guessing his wife wanted a boy maybe more than he did so he wants to make Elizabeth happy he wants to make himself happy he really just wants to have a boy for the Lord and I believe this desire was put in both of them from God it wasn't a bad desire it wasn't an evil desire but he prays and he waits and 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 and there's no son and he finally gets too old enough to have any kids he waits his whole life and don't we wonder what God is doing when we wait why is he listening? Why doesn't he hear? So as I went through this story and thinking about Christmas and, and uh, trying to look at things in a bit of a new light, I, I just came t- t- with four really lessons that I can learn in the wait, and I hope they're helpful to you too. And we can probably get more than that, but these are just the ones that jumped out to me. And the first thing I got is insignificance in this world is not insignificance in the plan of God. Because I feel insignificant and like, God's not listening to me and no one else would. It doesn't matter. Insignificance in this world is not insignificance in the plan of God. When you think of the plan of God and how we get to know him, I came up kind of this week with three stages. You know, when we first get to know God, you know, Paul said, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. It starts with belief or relying on him, trusting in him. So begins belief. But that belief, if it's real, ends up with a stirring of the Holy Spirit in our, in our hearts. We believe that Jesus died for me and he's God in the flesh and we love him. And we understand that he knows more than we do and we trust him in that. And so that leads to obedience. Belief leads to obedience. It has to. If it doesn't, then there wasn't any belief to begin with. But then as that bo- obedience grows, I think that we are often led to a time of wait. Um, it's like we have days, all of us do, that are the, the difficulties of Good Friday. And we know God's told us there's going to be Resurrection Sunday. But sometimes we live in Saturday. It's just the way. So we believe, and that belief produces obedience. But then somehow we think in our heads, oh, I'm believing, I'm obeying. Everything's going to be good. And then we end up at camp. Luke chapter 1, verse 5, page uh, 697 in, in this Bible. It says, In the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division, and the divisions come up later, the division of Abia. And then it talks about Elizabeth, who's also a, a descendant of Aaron. Now, in the first century, if you were looking at who was significant, Zechariah wouldn't have been in your list of significant people. Herod would have been in your list of significant people. But it's interesting to me that Herod, for God, as he's writing scripture, is insignificant. He's a footnote. All he is is a mile marker to know when and where we're talking about. And so historians can come back later and say, yeah, the Bible is accurate. He gives us a time and a place, but that's all that he's worth. It's just a mile marker. It's Zechariah that this is about. If we were writing, you know, a, a history of the times, and then you would think that you would be writing about Caesar, or maybe the chief priests, and, and you know, Ananias, and, and, but it's not. It's Zechariah we're going to talk about. 
Because significance in this world isn't what makes us significant in the plan of God. Now, God can use significant people in this world. He used Daniel when he was a leader in Babylon. He used Esther as, as queen of Persia. But he also uses Mary and Joseph, a couple of teenagers from a town of 500. And I love the story of Moses partly because when he is significant as prince of Egypt, one of the most powerful people in the world, he's unusable by God. It's not till he goes out for 40 years and herd sheep as a nobody that God is able to make him significant and put him in his plan. If you feel insignificant, it doesn't mean you're out of the plan of God. One other reason I like this story is because, you know, as you read through Scripture and you read through the story of Christ and you, and you know the good, the good news that, you know, God became flesh and came and lived a perfect life and died and rose again for us and we can put our trust and faith in him, it, it, didn't, it doesn't need to be in here. You know, I mean, the book could only be so long, God could have left it out and we'd still have everything we need for the gospel. So I love that it's in here because I think it's really in for us. So God can teach us, you know what? Even when you pray and you wait and you pray and you wait and you pray and you wait, it doesn't mean you're insignificant and it doesn't mean I'm not listening. You're still in my plan. I'm still doing something. So hang in there. One other thing I think we can learn from it just as a part of this is if I was Zechariah, what would be going through my head is what does sometimes when things are going lousy what did i do wrong that you aren't answering this prayer what did i do wrong to get in this fix but this has nothing to do with doing wrong he's in the plan of god god doesn't say if you obey me everything ends up perfect if you hear someone teaching that they're probably selling something it's not the way it works he's in the plan of god even though things aren't going great Although I did ask him, what did I do that you won't have a car wash open? No, I didn't. <laughs> Secondly, and on that idea, an obedient life doesn't guarantee a painless life. It's not going to be painless. Verse 6 says, both of them were righteous in the sight of God. They observed all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly, but they were childless. They prayed and waited, prayed and waited, prayed and waited, and God still had them childless because God had a plan. They didn't know it. We pray and wait. We don't know God's plan. But we believe and we obey and we wait. They were childless because Elizabeth wasn't able to conceive and they were very old. And just to get in the context of the story for the next four weeks too, you know, these were hard times. Um, Caesar Augustus, awful guy in charge of the civilized world. And then we've got Herod the Great, who's over this area. And Herod, um, I don't know how many sons he had, but I know two he strangled to death and another one he executed. Uh, not a real sweet guy to be a ruler. And that's why he can kill the kids in Bethlehem and it, it doesn't really make history. It was just kind of a normal day for him. That's where he lived, and I think if I was Zechariah, I would be saying, but God, it's not who I voted for. <laughs> now my plan, God's plan. Second thing that kind of um, jumped out to me in this passage, and it does sometimes when I'm reading through, and I, and I realize it's because my theology is a little askew. So part of this is a theological confession. When I read, both of them were righteous in the sight of God. They followed him blamelessly, then immediately in my theology, I think, wait a minute, that can't be right because the only perfect person who's ever lived is Jesus. He's the only one who's blameless. There's no one good, Jesus says, but God alone. So how can it say that they were righteous when righteousness only comes uh, because God forgives us of our sins? And he's talking about, uh, about their lives here. And so here's a problem in my theology. When I see righteous, I often think, of following this list of rules. And so what I'm saying is, oh, God says they were righteous. That means they never, ever, ever did anything wrong. They didn't steal the chocolate chip cookie at five years old. Right? They were righteous. Jesus didn't. But that's not what it means. It's not right doing as much as right being. It's being in Christ. 
So when we accept Jesus as our Savior, it doesn't mean that we never do something wrong, but it means our being changes. God, the Holy Spirit, comes inside and gives us different desires and a different perspective and a different way to go. So the bulk of our life goes a different direction. We are righteous. We're washed with the blood of Christ, and we have a different direction. I'm still going to have messed up days. I'm still going to want to do a UE on 550, even though the sign said don't do it. I still want to have those days. You know what stops me? That anchor point sticker on the back of the car. Okay. So that might not have been right. Being that might have been, I'm going to get caught. But still, it, the whole idea behind here is your acts, what we call acts of righteousness, the good deeds you do have no righteousness in them. There is nothing righteous in the best thing you do. There's no righteousness in that. The righteousness that we have comes from God alone. There's nothing we can do that is that. But when we do what's right, because we love him, be because we believe in him, because we act different, because we belong in him, then those righteous acts bring us face to face with God. And that changes our being, that changes who we are. That's how they were righteous. Just a good check on my theology. And they were righteous in their being. They believed in God. They believed in the Son that he was going to send. They believed in the Messiah coming. But they were waiting and waiting and waiting for the Messiah that he didn't come. They're living in Rome, which is totally messed up. And they pray and they wait and they pray and they wait and they pray and wait for a son and he's not there. And maybe that's where you are. If it's not where you are, hang on, you'll be there. He comes, right? And when we're there, we wonder, is it worth it? You know, I hear that. Is it worth it? I've been praying and waiting. Is it time for me to punt? This brings us to number three. It's easier to pray for a miracle than believe in one. But either way, God answers those who wait. It's easy to, easier to pray in a miracle than believe in one. Um, I think of my parents praying for my brother to come to faith. And I'm eight, he's 18 when he leaves home. And every night we had devotions around the table that I hated because the kids were outside playing and we had to sit around the table. But every night they would pray for David. They prayed and waited, prayed and waited, prayed and waited. And the day I left for college when I was 17, David accepted Christ. And he was 27. And it was real because here we are, I mean, it's, Gosh, I'm in my 30s now, and he's still walking. I'm kidding. Long time ago. Just want to make sure you're with me. It's easier to pray for a miracle than believe in one, and I struggle with that. Um, I love the passage in, in Mark 9 where the guy's son is possessed. Anybody else here have a... Don't raise your hands. The guy's son was possessed, just out there, totally possessed. The guy comes to Jesus and, and wants Jesus' help, and and... So Jesus talks about belief. You know, do you believe in me? Because as you, as you believe in me, then that changes your insides, and then you obey me, and then you, and then you wait, and I answer your request. You know me. And he says, oh, I, I believe. Help my unbelief. The, here's the beauty. I know James says we need to pray without wavering, and that's where I want to get. But until I get there, I'm still going to pray. Still pray. Even if you're having struggling with belief, still pray. Uh, my good, uh, not good friend, but friend, Randy, he used to sit here and back, and, and I, I've known him for over 10 years. He went to see Jesus on Tuesday night. We talked about him last week. But, you know, we'd get together with him and, um, and pray. God, um, I don't know if this is your will or not, but I'd love to see him healed. Would you heal him? I really want to see his family come to faith. If not, I know you're going to bring him home. It, it, I think the very act of praying shows there's a spark of faith still within us. So even when we don't feel it, even when it doesn't seem possible, we pray. Oh, we had a, a kid in the church uh, about five, six years ago um, who was born, and uh, they couldn't get him oxygen, and he went eight minutes without oxygen. They had to rush him to a different hospital. They put him on ice because of brain swelling and all that kind of stuff. And we knew that he probably wouldn't be around, and if he was, he, you know, there would be damage. Then his mom went home, and she just had 
uh, major issues. She shouldn't have been sent home. And I was certain, just on this planet Earth, leaving God out, I was certain I was going to be doing two funerals in a week. And I was planning, how am I going to do these? How do I get through these? How do I help Dad? And Dad's come here to church. They live in Virginia now, but they have a rental house here. And, and he's come once in a while. He comes when he's in town. And, uh, but we pray and we wait and we pray and we wait. And, you know, that, that kid's totally normal. I mean, they kept him on ice for like a week or something at UNM. I mean, he's totally normal. And mom. Now, I don't understand it. The doctors don't understand it. And I don't know why it, it, one person's healed and another person's not. I don't get that. God says, that's not for me to get. That's his plan. That's not my plan. But I pray and I wait. But it's easier for me to pray than believe. I've got a picture here of the temple. And uh, we've talked before about uh, just the size of the temple a little bit and what it's like. Thousands of people would come. Uh, Josephus says up to 200,000 would come for the high holy days. And I don't know how many were there at a time, but Herod the Great had made it massive, massive. And so there's this outer court, and there's a place the Gentiles can go, and the place the women can go, and all that kind of stuff. But the closer you got to the sanctuary, the middle, the closer you got to God. And that's the way it was designed. Now, by the time that, that Zechariah lives, it says, the Old Testament tells us that God's glory had left the temple because the people had, had gone away from him. But before that, God's glory was actually behind the curtain in the Holy of Holies. So they're still worshiping the same way as if God's glory is behind the Holy of Holies, the place only the high priest can go and only once a year. And if he goes there with sin, then he was dead. So this part of the sanctuary is called the Holy Place. And it's right at the door of God. You see, it's just right there on this side of the curtain. Now, when Jesus dies on the cross, the curtain's torn from top to bottom, which means man didn't do it. And I think it was like six inches thick anyway. And it's torn. It's show that we have direct access to God. But when Zechariah lives, pre-Jesus, the priest prayed for the people. And the priest prayed in the holy place. Now, from the time of Aaron the first priest, to the time of Zechariah, we had more and more priests born down Aaron's line. By this time, we have over 20,000 priests. Zechariah is one of them. And it's divided into 24 different divisions, and it said which division he was in. And his division would get to go and work in the temple two weeks a year, two separate weeks. Each week they went there, they would draw another name out of the hat of people who had never served in here because you only got to do it once. And that would be your one week. It was a lottery. And this was like the best lottery. I, I, it's almost as good, not quite as good as a, while, a, a little while ago, someone gave me uh, tickets to ride in a Lamborghini. And I had a choice between a Lamborghini and a Ferrari, and I chose a Lamborghini because it was just prettier. Anyway, when I got there, they said, are you sure you don't want to drive it? I said, drive it? <laughs> so I forked over a little more money. I'm sorry about Christmas, Joe. And, and uh, I got to take some laps in the Lamborghini. Now, what a lottery, right? Okay, so this is the same kind of lottery. They pull the lottery out, but chance of all chances, in God's divine plan, Zachariah's name is chosen. And he gets to spend a week in here. Now, this, on, on the left, uh, that menorah, I, I, I think, is representative of the Holy Spirit, the seven spirits of God that would be lit and lit the holy place. Over on the right is the table of showbread. There was unleavened bread, and, and we're told there was also uh, wine on there. And that, I mean, Jesus at the Last Supper, right? He breaks the bread, and, and we drink the wine. as a sign of his covenant. So we have the Holy, God, the Holy Spirit. We have God the Son. And then straight forward, we have the altar of incense. And we just sang a little bit ago about coming to the altar. Well, when Zechariah went to the altar, he went to the altar. And this is a, just a huge deal right at the gateway to the presence of God. And, and when the incense was lit, the altar of incense, when the incense was lit at the altar, it went up in front of the curtain as the prayers of all Israel going up to God. And there would be this crowd of people on the outside praying for him as he's on the inside. And they're saying, you know, pray for our sins, confess our sins as a nation that God would forgive them, that one day the Messiah would come and die for them and wash them away. And that's where he is. In verse 11. And then an angel of the Lord appears to him standing at the right side of the altar. Now, he's the only one in the room. And this guy shows up. 
big, intense angel, probably built like me. Okay, you're still here. <laughs> when Zechariah saw him, he was startled and gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, don't be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard. Your prayer and your prayer and your prayer and your prayer and your wait and your wait and your wait and your wait. It's been heard. Your wife Elizabeth is going to bear a son, and you're going to call him John. And then he says, uh, later, he goes on to say this John's going to be a joint delight. He's going to be great in the sight of the Lord. He's never going to have any fermented drink. He'll never get a DWI. He'll be filled with the Holy Spirit. He's going to bring people to God, and he's going to, be for, he's going to go before the Lord in the strength and power, in the spirit and power of Elijah. So that was a prophecy from 700 years ago and 400 years ago that's coming true with your kid. It was crazy. And so Elijah hears all this, and he'd have to think back to Isaiah 40, comfort, comfort my people. The voice of the one in the wilderness will yell, prepare the way of the Lord. And he knows this angel's talking about his son's going to be the one that does that. And he has to think, me have a perfect kid? I don't know. And my kid be the one to pre prepare the way for the Messiah? I don't know. It's easy to pray for it. It's hard to believe in it. So Zechariah asked the angel, verse 18, how can I be sure of this? You need to understand, he says, I'm an old man and my wife is well along in years. In other words, angel, you may not understand all the things that you know, go on in the human life, but if we're going to have a kid, something's got to change. The angel said to him, and it seems to be in contrast to me, for Zechariah says, I am an old man. The angel says, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. I have been sent to speak to you and tell you this good news. And now you will be silent and not able to speak until the day this happens because you didn't believe my words, which will come true at their appointed time. We believe, we obey, and we wait. You just got the time wrong. At their appointed time. Now, when I read this, it seems to me that he's kind of picked on because if you go down to verse 34, Mary asks, how can this be since I'm a virgin? And what does the angel do? He gives her the answer. Zechariah asks, how can this be? What does the angel do? Oh, you're going to lose your voice, you jerk. It's very much like Jolene and I drive in a car. I'm in the car. I get pulled over. Where's the fire, son? $200 later, I'm on my way. Jolene gets pulled over. I'm so sorry to bother you. Do you need an escort? So the question is, why the difference? I think it's because Mary asks, how will this be? She's believing it's going to happen. She just doesn't know how. Zechariah asks a different question. He asks, how can I be sure of this? Or if you go for the word-for-word -word translation, if you go on to uh, uh, anchorpoint.life and look at our Bible study tools in there, it comes out like this. By what will I know this? What's he asking for? So Gabriel says, you want a sign? <laughs> I'll give you a sign. <laughs> yeah, going to speak. I was reading an article in a magazine. This author was being interviewed, and, and she, said, uh, she said, I don't believe celestial beings are sitting around asking, aren't those humans amazing? I think they're sitting around asking, isn't it amazing that God hasn't blown them up yet? Finally, God gives good gifts to those who wait. Last thing we learn. Verse 57, it was time for Elizabeth to have her baby when it was God's time, not Zachariah's time, not Elizabeth's time. She gave birth to a son. And all her friends are there and they get all excited about it and then it's finally time for circumcision and, and they go to name him and they say, you're going to name him Zachariah, aren't you? And she says, uh, uh, no, his name's going to be John. And they ask her again and she says, no. So then they said, well, we'll see about that. We'll bring Zachariah in here. So Zachariah comes in the room, and they ask him, what's the name going to be? And he gets a tablet, and he writes down, his name is John. I'm convinced that throughout all this struggle, through this long nine months, God's plan for Zechariah didn't change. God's, Zechariah's lack of belief didn't change God's plan. Zechariah's lack of belief didn't change God's love. But the last nine months changed Zechariah. You know what the name John means? Gift of God. The grace of God. I think that's why God gave him that name. 
Lamentations 3 says, The Lord's good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. It is good that I should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. We believe that belief produces obedience. And then we pray and we wait. And John the Baptist was worth the wait. Jesus said, Among those born of woman, women, there has not risen anyone greater than John. He fulfills the promise of Malachi 4 and Isaiah 40. He prepares the way for the Lord to come. And then in kind of a cool thought, Jesus has to wait for him to prepare the way before he gets his ministry going. Isn't that kind of cool? And then when Jesus' ministry gets rolling, it's John the Baptist who says, Jesus must become greater, I must become less. So the four things that jumped out to me in this less known Christmas story is that uh, being in insignificant in this world isn't insignificant in the plan of God. And as I think of Moses, I may need to become more insignificant to be in his plan. Secondly, an obedient life doesn't guarantee a painless life. It's reading in the Psalms, and it refers back to Joseph. And, you know, Joseph was told he was going to have this significant place. Later, he has this dream, but then he's sold by his brothers, and he goes into Egypt. He's falsely accused, and he goes into prison. But the Psalms say he had his neck in a collar of iron and his feet in chains. And he had to wait 13 years. We believe. We keep on obeying because God says something in our heart. And then we pray and we wait to see what God does. Finally, God gives good gifts to those who wait. Oh, it's easier to pray for a miracle than believe in one. And God gives good gifts to those who wait. Zechariah had a prayer burden for a son. And I'm wondering what your prayer burden might be. What is it you've been asking God for and waiting and asking God for and waiting? You know, if it's for your parents or your kids or a friend to come to Christ, can I just say, keep praying and waiting? Keep praying and waiting. If there's those you love and relationships that are hurt and it doesn't feel like they can ever come around, keep praying. Every time you pray, there's a spark of belief in that prayer. Because God alone provides the remedy for our brokenness through Jesus Christ. What he asks is, are you willing to wait? Would you stand? So, I feel sorry for the rest of you. I think you've just started listening to Christmas songs. Um, I've been going since early October. And one of them I enjoy is Hark the Herald. And uh, we speak a different language and part of it, Gloria in Excelsis Deo. Glory in the heavens, or in the highest, to our God. Glory to God in our highest. And, and of course, we're quoting the angels as they come to the shepherds, but why are they yelling, glory to God in the highest? Because his promise has finally come true. Because the wait has been worth it. So whatever you are waiting on now, can you say glory to God in the highest? Because his wait's going to come true. And Jesus not only came once, but he's going to come back again. And glory to God in the highest, that he, he's going to come through. One other attribute of God, number 24, says God is faithful. He honors his covenants and fulfills his promises. Our hope for the future rests on his faithfulness.